God's love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave gonna hold my body. There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna rise up out of the ground. There ain't no grave.
took our place. And on the third day, Jesus rose again. He burst out of that, that tomb that held him. One day, people, we're going to rise up with him. He is our conqueror. He came as a lamb, but he is returning as a lion. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking to. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking to. Oh, if you walked out of the grave, I'm I would believe we've been jumping and shouting that whole song. <laughs> Amen. There ain't no grave. If you got your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, we're going to finish up chapter 1 today. <laughs> Revelation chapter 1. We're going to pick up there in verse 17. And once you get there, if you don't mind, we're going to stand and give reverence to the reading of of this good book. John, con continuing his letter to the church, says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death in Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Let's pray. Father God, we come thanking you for your goodness, for your kindness upon us. Father, for your grace and your mercy and the love that you show us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you'll let your spirit pour down upon us as we hear the rain falling upon the earth. We ask for your guidance and your direction, Father, for your insight as we open up your word today. Father, I pray that you'll hide me behind the cross of Christ, that the words that I say will glorify Him and lead others to want to know more about Him. Lord, forgive us where we have fallen short. We ask in Jesus' mighty, mighty name, amen and amen. You know, one of the reasons most folks study this book is to get some idea of how things are going to play out in the days to come. We like to think that, just read all of this and say, okay, th this is how it's going to be. What, what's going to take place? Uh, we're going to try to get all the answers to the questions. Well, you don't exactly get all the answers to all the questions, but you kind of get a little bit of an idea of how things are going to be. 
I mean, after all, the Lord wrote this letter to his servant John to tell his church how it is and that we're to be ready and to encourage us in, in times as we see things happening around us to, to stand fast in our faith and for those who have not accepted him to repent before it's eternally too late. John's giving us some clues here and painting a picture about how history will look like in the future. I've, I've got in my pocket a couple set of keys. I've got some church keys and some house keys over here. I've got my truck key on this side. Um, keys are good, good things. I mean, open doors with these. I, I can start my truck. Nobody else can start my truck up unless they got, I've only got one of these. So if I lose this, I am in trouble. But you can't get in there to that. Um, those, those represent things. Those, those keys, do they represent ownership? Obviously, my, this is my truck. These are my keys to, to my house and, and to the office and everything here. Uh, they signify control. I've got control over some things. They can even symbolize some stature. Uh, I'm not driving a BMW. I'm driving an old pickup truck, so that might tell you where I'm, I'm sitting at. But, but in this book, Jesus gives us some keys. He has some keys. He, he's going to give us some keys so that we can take the keys that he gives us and unlock what is written in the word and then see the implications that these words might have for your life, for my life, and for those that are around us. The, the text today, if you've noticed in the bulletin, there, there's an outline. For those of you who are very... Uh, structured and, and like, I thought this was so, this is so cu cute. I found this uh, in, in studying for this passage. And I said, you know what? Those, those folks that their mind just likes to list things out and they like notes. This is going to be great because it's really clean and, and, and neat. And if you don't like those things, we'll just sit back and enjoy the sermon. It'll be all right. Ver verse 19 actually gives us the outline for this passage. Jesus says here, write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place a little later. Pretty simple, right? I mean, three things there. What's, what you have seen, what, what is now, and, and what will take place a little bit later. So the first thing that John writes, is writing about, as we have been covering chapter 1, is the past. Write about the things that you've seen. Can you guys imagine what John could have wrote about? All the things that he had saw. He actually ends his, his letter, his earlier letter, his, his gospel presentation with, there are so many things that I could write about, about what Jesus had did, that they wouldn't, there, there's not enough books in the world that would be filled and, and, and so all the things that he, he could have wrote about, and yet here in this letter that he wrote to us, it, it's just a basic foundation, and, and it kind of fixes our eyes in, in one particular place. It fixes our eyes on Christ. He, he says, focus on Jesus. And, and, and so when, when we think about our life, whatever there was in the rearview mirror, it's behind us. It, it, it's back there in the past. And if you're in Christ Jesus, it's now covered by his blood. Amen? If you call him Savior and Lord, then he paid the price for all your sin. That, that's the past. And so John wrote down everything that the Lord had said, even about what Jesus held in his hands, the, the seven stars or messengers or pastors or, or however you want to do it. He's got the keys to death and, and Hades there. This is our conquering king. And John wrote all of that down so that we could reflect on that. He also wrote about the present. John is told to write about the things which are now. That, beloved, is the present. And as we're moving forward in the next couple of chapters, we're going to deal with the present. The present is the church age. Chapters 2 and 3 are, are dealing with all the things that are. Things that were in John's present, things that have continued in some way, fashion, or form, 
all the way up to today. Now, I'm not a dispensationalist, and what I mean by that is, <coughs> excuse me, I do not believe that each one of those churches represent an age of the church. There's some folks that say, okay, chapter, or, or, the book to Ephesus, that, that's an age of the church, and then Smyrna is a period of the church time. There's some folks that will break those down, and, and they'll say, well, we're in Laodicea, that we're the lukewarm I want to spit you out. I don't, I don't think that's right. I think there's churches today that, that are on fire for God. And, and so what I believe is all of these churches, every single one of them, you can find character traits within all of the churches. I, I think you could even, if you dig a little bit, you might even find character traits that, that describe individuals. People. May, maybe yourself. And, and what that does is, beloved, we, we begin to ask the questions. We're looking at a, at a church like Ephesus, and, and the question there is, have you lost your first love? You know, you're, you don't tolerate sin, you're, you're doing some right things, but then you're, everything seems kind of stagnant. Are you tolerating sin? Are you being faithful with what God has blessed you today? Those, those are the things that we're going to see with each one of these churches that we can relate to and that we can identify, not only in churches, but I believe, personally, in individuals. And then we see what, what are the implications then? What, what does Jesus say to those churches and those, those people? And so when John penned these words, the, the church was kind of coming out of her infancy. They faced some persecution they're beginning to develop their own identity separate from Judaism. And, and so these are letters to them to know that the absolute certainty that Christ is in the business of working in his church. He knows about the condition of every single church, every single individual. He knows our hopes and dreams and failures and, and he knows what's wrong. And so he's going to deal with those. And lastly, in the outline, it, it's prophetic. John is to write about the things to come. That, that's the future history. That, this is stuff that has not happened yet. And, and, and I believe that that's going to be chapter 4 on. This is the metatalteo in the Greek, which loosely translated means those things which shall be. We haven't said that. Those are the things that everybody is interested in, right? We want to know what's coming in the future. And so what God is doing for us, church, is he's giving us a little bit of insight of how it will be when he returns. This is history written in advance from the sovereign God who knows all things. God says, whatever we've seen or believed or responded to is of little consequence. It's all done. God's already set it in motion. The Lord has the final say in all matters. And so his sovereignty ordained all of these things, even things going on today and tomorrow, before the foundation of the earth was laid. And so at the end of chapter 3, the church age, I believe, is going to end. Time of the present is past. The things which shall be will begin to take place. For instance, in chapter 3, you're not going to see, after chapter 3, you're not going to see the church on the earth again. In fact, the next time we read about the church will be in chapter 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that, that's, that's a good year or so off. From where we're at. And so God is going to judge the earth. We're going to get into some of that as, as we see. And, and those who are left here are going to undergo a lot of wrath. His church is going to be taken with him while the world reaps exactly what it's sown. So this all goes to remind us that God was, God is, and God will forever be in control. And so for those of us, the, the true children of God, this is an encouragement, what we're reading through this book. This isn't all bad stuff, because we know that God's promise is true. Amen? God has promised us good things. Every word, every dot, every tittle will come to pass. And so when we apply this to our personal life and we bring God into focus, we see God's providence hand is, is working upon us. All of us and in the world and, and God's grace goes out to those who will trust in him because God knows our past. He knows our present. He knows our future. And he allows Christ's blood to cover our sins. And he says, if you believe in your heart, Jesus is Lord, confess with your mouth and, and repent, then you're forgiven. 
God, God knows all of those things. And so we're going to take a look at, at the implications of this out, outline, both the past, the present, and the future. Next, we're going to get an orientation. It's important in, in many areas of life to have the right orientation on things. We, we need to make the necessary adjustments of, of how we look at this book. For instance, when you, you have a new baby come into your, your home, things change, don't they? You're not sleeping through the night. You're getting up in the middle of the night to do some feedings and, and that sort of thing. When you get your driver's license, you've got to reorient yourself. You've got to start watching out for, can't sit there on your phone texting in the passenger seat like you normally did before, or reading a book or got your feet propped up on the dash. You, you try doing some of that while you're driving, you're going to be in trouble. And so you've got to get a new orientation and, and be open to everything that's around. You've got to watch out for that other guy, right? And so notice, I want you to notice, in verse 17, things change in our passage. John had been writing about the description of all the things that he's been seeing, but then, starting in verse 17, what changes, beloved? Right there in the middle of that verse, you, you guys notice it goes to one complete, uninterrupted letter, testimony from the Lord Jesus Christ. Middle of verse 17, it, the, the color changes in your Bible. It goes from black to red. And if you'll notice the next several chapters, a couple chapters, it's all red letters. It's because this is from Jesus. And he's, he's going to give us correction and commendation and, and all these things. And so what we see here is there's a change, there's a reorientation because, again, this is his church. It's what we talked about last Lord's Day. The, we're the lampstands, the, the, his church. His, his church is not a denomination, although I do believe that Baptists probably hold the closest to the inerrancy of Scripture. I believe our doctrine is more aligned with what this word says. We get a lot of things right, but we certainly get some things wrong as well. And we make mistakes. Our denomination is not perfect. And so the Lord is pretty clear on who He's addressing here. It's the makeup of all true born-again believers. It's His church. That being said, within His church, God is doing His workings. The Lord uses His church in many ways, as we're going to see in the, in the next coming weeks, to implement change in the world. In, in recent days, a lot of folks seem to discount the church. They seem to believe going to church is, is just an option. You don't have to show up here. I can, I can get church out on the golf course or while I'm fishing or maybe just watch it on TV or listen to it in, on the radio. But here's the thing, beloved, there is nowhere in Scripture that i found anywhere where the Bible says that you get saved and you don't become a member of a local church. Everywhere I read, when somebody gets saved, they plug into a local church. They become part of the body. Can you guys imagine standing before God on Judgment Day and saying, Lord, well... I didn't think you wanted me to become part of your church. That would be silly for us to, to get and say, Lord, I, I didn't think you wanted me to become part of your church and, and serve in some capacity. I just thought, well, I get saved and I'm good to go. I'm just skate on through life. No, it doesn't say that. It says you become a member of a local body. And, and here's the thing. You're not going to find a perfect church. If you're waiting to join a church to find the perfect church, you are not going to find it. It mentions seven in this book as kind of the complete number. Remember, seven is God's number of completion. None of them are perfect. He got something to say about every single one of these churches. And it's in God's church that he uses that to do his redemptive plan out in the world. Beloved, Jesus died for his church. He's building up his church. One day he's going to return for his church. Not this building, but the body and the bride, the people of God, because we are his church. We're going to see that this is his call. The text orients us to the seven stars or angels or messengers which are mentioned here in this letter. They're, they're written to the pastors of local churches. God called men 
like, like myself, to, to lead a, a body of believers. Reminded that, that the pastors or those messengers are in his right hand, which, which signifies importance and authority and responsibility and protection. These guys are, are meant to speak his word, to preach the truth. That It's a symbol of God watching over them and guiding and directing them. Seven is God's number of completion. So it's safe to say that the description we find here represents every single church. So God has called them and these men to lead them for commendation, for consequence, for correction, and commendation. See, beloved, God's not politically correct. God is eternally correct. And so he gives these words because he desperately loves his children. And his desire is for us to understand and to hear him. And one of the big things that we're to understand and to hear is about his character. John continues to give us a picture of who Jesus is. He, he's eternal. Jesus begins by telling John that he doesn't need to fear because he's the first and the last. He's already hinted at that earlier on in the chapter when he identified himself as the Alpha and Omega. And so, beloved, we can come before God. We don't have to fear him because he's the beginning and the end. And, and what that signifies is that God has absolute authority over all things. He is life. In verse 18, Jesus confirms that, that he is life with these words. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And so with that, there's no doubt that this is Christ. Amen. He says, I, I, I was dead. I was up talking in the youth room earlier with the youth. And, and we were talking about all the prophets of all the other religions. One thing's different than... In Christianity and all those other prophets. Guess what? All of those guys, they're dead. Muhammad's body is buried somewhere in the desert. Buddha, dead. Krishna, all those guys are dead. Jesus, however, rose three days later. He's alive. He is the living one. So there's no doubt that Jesus is Jesus. That, that is speaking. He is the only one who could make that claim. Literally translated, I became dead and now I am alive forevermore. It was the cross of Calvary, beloved, that the Lord died. Three days later, he rose again. He is seated at the right hand of the Father where he is continuing to live for all eternity and he is confirming for John for us that in fact, this is him. John 1, 4, he, John writes, in him was life and the life was the light of men. Jesus tells us in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life everlasting. And so, so we don't need to fear Christ, do we, church? Because he's life. He's, he's life for those, for us who believe in him, who, who's chosen to commit our lives to him. We have the promise in scripture that his testimony that, that God gave us out of 1 John 5 is eternal life. And this life is his son. And whoever has the son has life. Whoever doesn't have the Son does not have life. It also tells us that, that He's sovereign. Because what Jesus says is, I hold the keys of death and Hades. Remember, I got the keys in my pocket. This is ownership. He owns death and He owns hell. It's a picture of His authority and His control over those things. Jesus controls death. It's a reference to our physical death. He is in control of that. God tells us in his book, we're to number our days. We're, we're to know about these things. Holding the, the, the Hades in his hand is a picture of what happens to the soul after death. And so Jesus holds our destiny, our eternity. And so the message is very clear to us, beloved. The Lord is reassuring John and the church that he is the one who controls both life here on earth and life in the hereafter, in our eternity. And that ought to be a great encouragement to you, beloved. Because in effect, Jesus is saying, you don't need to worry about what you're about to face. I've already paid the penalty for sin. I've already covered death. And I control your destiny. He's going to tell one of the churches that we're going to read about later on, 
not to worry about the man who can kill the body, but rather worry about the one who can take the soul. So he's in total control. You might be thinking, well, Pastor, I don't, I don't need to fear, but, but what do I need to do? What, what, what should I do with all of this information that you're giving me now? Adrian and Rogers, you guys probably have listened to him before. He said that every single sermon needs an explanation. We've been covering that here up until this point. It needs an illustration. We've had a few of those, maybe not the best. And then it needs an application. Well, in order to fit my alliteration in the outline... I've changed application to obligation. We needed an O. That's the only thing I think of. You guys got something better, you can call me through the week and say, here, put this in your next outline. So obligation. How do we apply this? What do we need to do in, in light of studying this passage? Notice what John's reaction is in the passage. It's one of reverence. He falls face down as, as if he's dead. As soon as John sees Jesus, he, he, he heard the, the noise. It, it sounded like a, a, a waterfall. And he begins to turn. He, he saw the lampstands that were standing there, one in the middle. He gave us a little description of those lampstands. And then he focuses on Christ. And as soon as he notices that it's Jesus, he falls face down as though he is dead. And that might seem kind of surprising to us, considering that John spent three years of his life in the presence of the Lord, but, but this is different. When, when John was with Jesus before, he, his glory was veiled. Now, that, that body is gone. This is the resurrected Christ in all his glory. It's much like John had seen on the Mount of Transfiguration. Paul refers to this in Philippians chapter 2 when he reveals, reveals that Jesus made himself nothing by taking the form of a servant. So he veiled his deity so as to not blind anybody. We read throughout scripture when God reveals his vision to himself to Daniel in Daniel chapter 10. It says Daniel lost all his strength and he falls to the ground. He, he couldn't get up for several days. At least four times Ezekiel is exposed to the glory of God, and each time he falls with his face to the ground. When Isaiah is transported in a vision into the presence of God, he responds in similar manner with a proclamation, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. So if anytime God com anybody comes into the glory of God, they fall down. Paul on the road to Damascus, you may remember that passage. He's coming along and he sees the resurrected Christ before him and he is blinded as he falls to the ground in the presence of God's glory. Again, John had been exposed to this once before. Matthew chapter 17, it says, He was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as, as light. And behold, there appeared them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here, for if you wish, we will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. You guys may know the song, 2001, Mercy Me came out with their album and the title on that track was I Can Only Imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine. According to what this passage tells us, I don't think there's a whole lot of doubt to how we're going to respond when we come into God's presence. Now, yeah, later on, we might do some dancing and some shouting and, and, and praying, but when we first come into God's glory, I think the only response that's going to be happening is we fall upon our face because of His 
glory. We've been given the portrait of Christ in His glory, and, and this is how we need to respond daily. We fall before God every single morning and say, Lord, we, we, we thank You, we, we love You, we, we come before You, God, because you guys are like me. It's just remarkable to me that he even decided to save me. That, that he uses me the way that he uses me. And so we combine all that we see in this passage, and there are two other actions that I think that we need in response of Jesus' is all. The second is reflection. We talked about last week, it's absolutely essential that we think of Jesus as he really is. Not, not as we want him to be. I, I think a lot of folks would would maybe want Jesus to be this all-loving, all-mushy type of individual where it doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter what you say, you just kind of, it's okay. That's not how he is. Jesus is just a, a good moral teacher, a good man. He is God incarnate. He is a holy and righteous God. He is this God that we see in Revelation who although he loves his church and is taking care of them and he's got some, but he's got some words of rebuke for several of them. In the rest of the world that has not accepted him it's not going to be very pretty. So are we truly in awe of Christ? Do we live that way? Because he desires for us to do that. We have to think about him in all of his greatness. Yeah, we, we reflect on His grace and His compassion and His love, but we also need to recognize that He is a holy God, that He is a righteous God, He is a just God, and He will punish sin. The next thing we need to do in all of Him is to remember. Once we see the greatness of God, it inevitably leads us to recognize our own unworthiness before Him. I think that's the reason that we read in the passage that once John sees the glory of God, he initially falls on his face. Because he's, he's confronted with the holiness of a righteous God. And everything then is put into perspective. Knowing about the things that you did in your life, that I did in my life, I don't think that we could come before a holy God in all his glory and look him in the eye. Because we recognize that little lie we told, those things that we thought about, those things that we did. Not that we walk around, you know, completely in, in guilt. You guys remember several years ago, all those allegations came out on Tiger Woods, if you follow the sports world. Anytime he was asked any question, he had a hard time looking anybody straight in the eye for a long time. And so I think it's kind of how when we come into God's glory, we're going to fall on our feet. We understand that we've, we've been coming, we've been forgiven by the shed blood of Christ, but we recognize our own unworthiness. And so we fall with our faces to the ground, remembering what Christ had did for us. Scripture says there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. But it's still helpful for us to have a proper perspective. So Paul reminded us in these words out of Romans chapter 12, For it is by grace given to me that I say to everyone among you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And so we notice that that while it's certainly appropriate for John to fall on his face before Jesus, that's not where he remained. The Lord comes up to John, as we see in the passage, and, and he touches him on the shoulder. He says, don't be afraid. And I can imagine in that moment, it was very similar to another touch that John had received about 60 years prior to this, where the Lord said, rise and have no fear. The assurance that we get in this letter, beloved, is that as his children, we need not fear the Lord. Even though the, throughout the vision of this book, there are going to be some pretty frightening things, we can trust that our Lord is in control. Perhaps you're here today and, and all this is kind of new. 
saying, well, we, we really don't know what, what's all going on here, but I'd like to know more about that. Maybe you've never put your trust in a risen Savior and Lord. So what we're going to read in the next several chapters over and over and over again are these words. To he or she who has an ear, let them hear what the Spirit says. And what Jesus is saying is that may your heart be open. May your ears hear the words that God is speaking to draw you closer to Himself. We're going to begin to study this God who's calling us to get closer to Him. Who wants the church to follow after Him. To self-examine everything that's in their heart and make correction. Because they are His church. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Quirt.